But you'll see a lot of that in here as well. So surviving and thriving adaptability in Python code. Get the next slide, please. Okay, um, I don't know very much about cosmism or modern cosmism, but I have a chain of reasoning that I think ends up leading kind of to the same thing, points in the same way, and maybe it will make sense to you as well. So if you look back and you consider where we come from, we were obviously the product of natural selection, and it's important to consider the natural selection aspect here, not focus too much on the issue of evolution at the moment, but the fact that there's a selection going on. Selection of the sort of things that can survive and the sort of things that don't survive. Survival being determined by your surroundings, by the environment, by the challenges that you face. So what we are is a result of a selection that went on given what was going on around us, what our environment was, and what it took to survive, just like so many other species that are out there. Some of which don't exist anymore because their surroundings changed. So we're suited to those challenges. And you see some of those right up there. The hunter-gatherer lifestyle, that was exactly what we were suited for. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect in any way. It's just a selection procedure. And you can see that we're already limited in a lot of ways. And people in the circles that I travel in often talk about certain kinds of limitations. One type of limitation that people are fond of pointing to is the duration of our lifespan and that they would like to live longer. Obviously, that's a limitation. But that's only one dimension. There are other dimensions, such as the ones I've pointed out here, that are more limitations in our thinking. So you've got here the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve, showing how we forget things that we learn. Our memory is definitely not perfect in that sense, or perhaps forgetting serves a purpose as well, but sometimes we really wish we could remember things. And then there's this other example here, Burst and spike activity. This is just an example of a, typic, a type of neuron and the maximum rate at which it can fire. Now compare that, if you look here, the speed of a neuron, you look at these other things that are transistors and pieces of computers and various advances in the computer sciences, and you see that, of course, the machines we built, they can fire, they can activate, switch much more rapidly than neurons can. That's a very basic limitation. You know, even if we try to improve how we think with drugs, stem cells, whatever you want to do, we're still working with the biological neuron, it's got a certain maximum speed. And there are tons of other limitations like that. So when I hear people talking about how the most important thing for us to do is to extend our lifespans, I think to myself, yeah, that's really true, that is very important, it's interesting, we like to have more time, but it's really not the only limitation that we could be looking at. There are so many other limitations. There are lots of dimensions to the problem because we really are only well suited for a certain niche. Go ahead, the next slide, please. Now, that doesn't need to be a problem if you're in a static environment, something that doesn't change. But that's not what we're in. We know that already because there have been many species that no longer exist. Challenges do change. Sometimes that's due to external forces. You know, there's the whole, oh, why are the dinosaurs gone? A meteor or a comet or something came by, perhaps. That's the most likely theory right now. And, you know, their environment changed and they couldn't survive anymore. A lot of other species also disappeared, and something similar could happen to us. And eventually, if we just wait long enough, well, the sun is going to gobble up the Earth, so at some point, our environment won't be here anymore. That's the type of external thing that you might worry about, or aliens that come and visit us and take over. <coughs> Where are they? I know, so maybe they're not going to come. But um, there are also the possibilities of unintended consequences. And I know I'm not going to play into hype about artificial intelligence, but keep in mind that many technologies that we've invented have had unintended consequences. And sometimes unintended consequences can be really severe. And the fact that we might have to compete with artificial intelligence in many areas could be one of those things. But sometimes it's not about challenges changing because something's imposed upon us, but sometimes it's really that we would like to be in a different niche. Do we want to have slow neurons and want to be forgetting things? Do we want those limitations? Or would we rather be able to think in a way where we could actually process all that stuff that's happening the whole time, all this information we're producing these days? Do we really only want machines to be able to experience those things? Or would we like to be able to experience those things? So there's this question, 
Do we even want to stay in our niche? Or do we want to move to another one? Sometimes it's about those sort of mental things. Sometimes it's about more physical things like space travel. Why is it so hard to travel in space? It's not because we can't cross those distances. It's because it's hard to do that when you're stuck in this body. This body has a lot of mass. This body requires oxygen and heat. It doesn't like radiation. So there are a lot of reasons why that's not perfect for space travel, and that's why all of our space travelers are robots. OK. Next slide, please. OK, this is a little bit of a joke, really, but yeah. Um, the issue to understand is we can't just say, OK, as long as evolution is going on, don't worry. <coughs> We'll get elevated to the next level. We can somehow hope that evolution takes us on to the next challenge. This is not how it works, because it is natural selection. Natural selection is kind of a mean thing. It just culls whatever doesn't work. So, let's say, take this as an example, that artificial intelligence happens to be more competitive all, at all of the things that really matter. Then, in the best case scenario, perhaps we just slip into irrelevance. Maybe something worse happens. But in any case, it might not be our, our desired circumstances, because perhaps we would really like to be a part of everything new that happens and not just stand by and watch the AI do everything that's interesting. So the alternative is we have to do this evolving ourselves, because since natural selection doesn't elevate you to the next niche, you'd have to do it yourself. Next slide, please. Now that's all about adaptability, because how do you get there? How do you get to another niche where you're able to handle other challenges, you need to adapt. Uh, especially since these are not always going to be the same changes. They, the challenges keep changing, our goals keep changing. So perhaps we should optimize for adaptability. Maybe that's what we should be really good at. And in a sense, we already are. Not in all ways, but in many ways, because we are tool builders. And we make things like clothing so that we can live in places where we normally wouldn't be able to live. So this is something that we have some experience with. It's kind of what defines humanity. It's what makes us different from most other animals. Next slide, please. Now, where is this going to lead? Or where should we be going in terms of adaptability, if you think it through? Ultimately, you would like to be able to totally modify our physical and mental being as necessary to get into that niche to be able to handle those challenges that we're really interested in or that we have to deal with. Now, that's all this kind of stuff I already talked about. Living in space, traveling fast, or for long periods of time, withstanding heat, all that kind of stuff. This is very physical stuff. And sure, you know, that's something you could, you could modify the body, you could try to replace the body, you could try to travel through telepresence and things like that. Um, ultimately though, if you really want to be able to deal with all these new challenges, like understanding all of that data that's being produced, ultimately the mind has to be able to deal with that, it has to be able to cater to those new challenges. So it's really about being able to completely access and modify the mind as necessary. Now of course, that doesn't have to be something that happens where you know, you're changing your mind to something completely different overnight so that you are no longer yourself. This can be something gradual, just like we generally change, have brain plasticity, but it's a little bit more than that. Now one thing that's of course really important here is to just understand that mind emerges from brain function. So it's a mechanism in a sense, it's a machine that's producing something, but it is not ideally suited to accessing modification. This thing here, very hard to get in there and to change anything really fundamental, such as, I want my neurons to fire 10 times faster, because they're just not gonna recover from that. That's not how the physiology is built. Okay, next slide. So some of this can be addressed through technologies that we're already working on. The main areas there are neural interfaces and neural prostheses. Neural interfaces are when you connect something with the brain and that talks to a machine, something that we have more power to modify and adapt, and it talks to the brain in some way. Neural prostheses is when you replace a little piece of the brain or a bigger piece of the brain with some piece of technology where, again, you have that access and the modifiability. But of course, if you're doing that in bits and pieces like this, it still needs to talk to the biology that remains in the brain. So when you're trying to get to that ultimate modifiability, that adaptability that allows the species to continue to thrive and survive, 
ultimately what you're talking about is being able to run all the mental functions we currently have on something that's fully accessible and modifiable. So in other words, a different substrate. That's why I call this pursuit as an objective, substrate independent minds. And by independent I mean you can use various different platforms, not that it doesn't have a platform. And then popularly getting there is called mind uploading. It's the long-term goal for optimal adaptability, and that's striving and thriving. Okay, next please. I want to get into something, a little bit detail here, not too long, because I'm sure there are tons of people here already comfortable with the idea of mind uploading. But there is this concern that is brought up often about, well, if someone carries out mind uploading, is it still going to be me? And it go that argument goes in a lot of directions. It's too, f too much to talk about all in one go here, but I just want to start with a very idealized circumstance, a thought experiment, just to at least, perhaps, make some people comfortable with the most idealized version of what mind uploading would be. And then you could get into more things, and you can talk to me about that afterwards. But let's assume for a moment, make a few assumptions here. We'll make an assumption that if you're trying to do mind uploading, that this is about creating prosthetic neurons and connections. That's brain building. There could be other components that are relevant. That's clear. But the same argument I'm making here, we could equally just easily expand to those components as well. So it's totally generalizable. So it's easier to just work with this for the thought experiment. We'll also assume that the prosthetic neurons involved here are functionally identical. We could imagine a biological replica of a neuron, right down to the atoms if you want to. Because this is really just about the thought experiment behind, will I still be me? Can one upload? Also, we're going to assume that we can engineer the system so that if we add a neuron somewhere in the system, we can pair it up with another neuron and they will simply act as if they were one and as if they were still the original neuron. In other words, the signal going to that old neuron and to the prosthetic neuron, they're identical, but the result doesn't change what's coming out of here, and the destination is also still receiving the signal as if it were just receiving it from the original. You can imagine some ways around that, such as, for example, an upregulation of thresholds over here, or something that modulates the signal only when both the original and prosthetic neuron are present. So there's some ways to work with that to make sure that your new system simply consists of original and prosthetic neurons that are together a redundant pair, doing the same thing, but not really affecting operation of the network. So if I add in a neuron, you can imagine what would happen if I remove the original one. It seems like everything's still working here after that cut. And most people would agree, this doesn't cause you to suddenly not exist. Neurons are disappearing all the time. New neurons also are still being created, for example, in your dentate gyrus, you still have a lot of neurogenesis there. This happens, and in this case, we were even more careful because they're not just dying or appearing, they are being carefully replaced to take over exactly that function. Now, we could do this, we could add all these prosthetic neurons for every single neuron, they're all paired up, and then we could randomly pick, are we going to cut away an original, are we going to cut away, away a prosthetic? So some of them are original, some are prostheses, this network here is one out of many possible end results that still basically carries out the same function and at no point ever lost activity, at no point was anything not working. It's basically the same thing you had here, but now a few different neurons in there. And then there's a version of that where you only end up with prosthetic neurons, so that's basically your ultimate mind uploaded situation. And then you can get into other scenarios where Instead of getting rid of the old ones, you just cut the connections, but you don't actually get rid of the neurons, and you can end up with many different scenarios where you have identical networks in parallel, and then you have to start wondering about things like, wait, are they both me? And that gets interesting, but it's a little philosophical, and I'm not going to get into it now. We talk about that as branching, and there's really no reason why, why that should be a problem, but people seem to get all hung up about it. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay. So, the basic example showing that it should be possible to do what I'm talking about is neuroprosthesis. And there is a very good example that exists today. There is a researcher by the name of Theodore Berger from USC who's worked on this for many, many years. He works in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is essential for our ability to make episodic memories. That's the ability to remember what happens from one moment to the next and store that away in your long-term memory eventually. And he, has, he began by experimenting with rats, 
who had to do this thing called a non, uh, sorry, a delayed non-matched sample task, where they had to press a lever, then they had to go away to do something else there, and then they had to remember that they pressed this lever and then press the opposite lever, and that way they would get um, they would get a reward. But in this period in here, they had to remember for a while that this was the one they pressed before, and so that is a test of episodic memory. And what he did is that he devised a model which carries out what's called system identification, meaning it watches activity at the input to an area, in this case the region CA3 in the hippocampus, and it watches activity at the output of that area through electrodes that are put in there. And then the mathematics tries to predict how is the input turned into that output. And once you have a good model of that by doing the observations, then you can cut away the original CA1 and use just the model, which could be either on a computer, it could be on a chip, he built a chip for it. And it turns out that once you put the model in, the rat is still able to carry out the task, it is able to remember. That took over the function of the hippocampus, at least within that experimental context. He then took that to primates, tested it there as well, just as successfully. He took it to the primate neocortex, not to replace pieces of the neocortex, but just broken connections between two layers, showed that that worked there as well. Other interesting things like what, do you, what happens if you add this artificial hippocampus in with a working hippocampus? Turned out you could learn faster. Um, what happens if you take a piece of trained hippocampus in a device, once you've made one of these prostheses from one rat and move it into another one, does the other rat understand how to do the task? Turns out the new rat learns faster, which in this case is specific to the hippocampus. Please don't think that you can just do that with every other part of the brain. Hippocampus has a few special properties about it that I won't get into. But he's shown basically that you can treat this as a machine where you can take parts, analyze them, make a replacement, put it in, and it can work. And now, they took it to human testing. He got DARPA funding to try this with patients who suffered from severe epilepsy. And the most recent results are, and I guess I won't read the whole thing, well, maybe I should actually. In human testing, individuals suffering from chronic seizure received the implant to help researchers see how accurately it could predict how their memories would be encoded. Researchers from Wake Forest Baptist read the electrical signals created during memory formation at two regions of the subject's hippocampi. The information was sent to a team at USC who conducted a research model of able to read how the signals generated in the first region of the hippocampus are translated by the second. In over 100 trials conducted with nine patients, the algorithm used by the implant predicted how the signals would be translated with about 90% accuracy. Being able to predict neural signals with the USC model suggests that it can be used to design a device to support or replace the function of a damaged part of the brain. That's really significant. Now we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so this means we can actually go and try to do this project. A project called whole brain emulation because if you do neural prostheses for all of the brain, that's what we get. So where are we with scanning the data in the brain? Because if you want to do whole brain emulation, you need to know how the pieces are connected to one another, and you need to know what those pieces do. And a lot of people think that if we can only find out well enough how all the pieces are connected and we can see morphology, then you can infer all the rest, especially if you know what you're doing, if you know what these different neurons look like and you know how they behave. So anyway, the standard way of going about that is electron microscopy. In electron microscopy, you just kind of cut through the, a, a piece of neural tissue, a piece of the brain, you keep taking images, then you put them all back together again, and then you try to find out what's in there. So we have these neurons and connections that are found inside of that piece of reconstructed tissue. There are several groups doing that, and it looks really pretty, but you can see here that it's a very, very small volume and that took a really long time to do. So this is a very hard way to work with actual sized brains, although eventually this was going to get better. Let's go on to the next slide. But where are we going on scanning these brains? Electron microscopy isn't really going to give us whole brains at the moment. But this might. Um, there's a new kind of microscopy that was developed at the Boyden lab at MIT called expansion microscopy. Expansion microscopy is optical microscopy, not electron microscopy. And they thought outside of the box. Instead of trying to make the microscope more powerful, which you can't at some point when you're dealing with optical microscopy here, um, they thought, well, what if we could make the sample larger? If we could expand it homogeneously? 
and they came up with a substance that they were able to put inside the tissue, then keep adding water, and it would expand in a homogeneous way, and it wouldn't even tear apart synaptic connections. And so now, you can see cells, individual neurons, pathways, and because it's optical microscopy, you can use fluorescence microscopy in there. You can, you can tag these with biological molecules so that you end up seeing things like specific synapses around this, this piece of dendrite and axon, whatever that one is. Now, that second part I just mentioned, adding pieces of biology in there to help fluoresce and show things, this is part of their project on molecular barcoding. Molecular barcoding in its simple form is exactly this, showing you what parts are in there, but it can get a lot more sophisticated. You can target very specific proteins, molecules, cells to identify which type of neuron you're looking at, which type of synapse, by using a combination of something engineered that will easily target and go to a specific receptor, for example, but also a piece of DNA or RNA that can be used as a code, a barcode, that you know how to identify which one it is, and you can read that out with a new technology called in situ sequencing. This was actually developed originally not to get the structure, but to get function, because the idea was we can put pieces of this new DNA inside a cell, keep replicating it on a circular amplification, and every time when there's activity in the cell, you get more errors in that replication. So when you then sequence what you're pulling out of that cell, you can see approximately what the activity was. That, that works to a degree in the lab, but they also came up with this whole other approach, which was really fascinating. Next, please. Okay, so where are we now on reconstructing brains, given that that sort of technology is being developed? Here's what you've got. You've got an image, then you put it together, you've got a stack where you can see some things, like, oh look, it looks like there's a piece of vasculature going through here, some arteries or something like that, a bunch of cell bodies. It's really dense in here. But you can reconstruct it, and you can see sort of what's there, but that's still just a picture. It's a three-dimensional image. A three-dimensional image is not the same as a functional model. These are the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, just to, in case you cared. It's, it's a way of describing what goes on in neurons. But this is the problem, really. How do you get there? From here, how do you get there? Who's ever done this successfully? Basically, no one. We lack information to infer function from structure. So this original idea that if we can just do the structural scanning well enough, that that's enough to get us to whole brain emulation, currently, no. Someday in the future, when we have a lot more understanding about the brain, probably yes. So 100 years from now, I'm willing to say there's a chance that just structural information is enough to be able to do a whole brain emulation. Right now, that's not the way to go. We can do direct functional system identification, though. That's what I was talking to you about that Ted Berger was doing is hippocampal prosthetic, looking at the activity and inferring from that what's going on. But that, for that we need better recording and stimulation devices. I just want to say one quick word about something else here, because people often also say things like, well, we don't know enough about the brain, not just in the sense that we can't infer function, but we don't even know which resolution we have to look at. And that's true. We're missing a lot of information about how deep do you need to go to get what you need to make that functional model because we don't know if the Hodgkin-Huxley equations are even enough. That said though, it would be um, probably wrong to assume that you need to go down the atomic level to get function out of it because we're not really trying to figure out how nature put together our system. We're trying to figure out how is the brain talking to itself? What is the language between regions of the brain? Why does this matter? An evolutionary patchwork. Nothing that we have inside of us was designed to be what it is today. It's all the result of something previous that something else was patched on top of. So when you look at here the process of LTP, that's long-term potentiation in the brain, strengthening the synapse, it's this huge cascade of all kinds of processes going on in here. And you know what? That really does matter when it comes to disease, because diseases can strike at any point in that patchwork. So if you care about solving diseases in biology, in humans, you actually need to address every part of that patchwork. That's not necessarily true when you're talking about function, though, because here, this is the equation that describes that same LTP, actually in this case, spike timing dependent potentiation, it's a slightly more precise way of describing LTP, that me and Pooh came up with uh, a while ago, and it's really a very simple equation. 
This is what really is the result of what's going on here. And this is what we care about when it comes down to things like learning. Now, as I said, there are things we probably are missing at the moment. That's why doing iterative work, like building a prosthetic and then doing a better one, that's really, sorry, really important. But, uh, but keep in mind, you don't have to deal with the whole patchwork quilt if you're talking about the function. Okay, next slide, please. Now, where are we on the functional data? This is an example of a Drosophila brain. Drosophila is a fruit fly. In this case, it's a larvae of Drosophila. And they use something called light sheet fluorescence, where there's a sheet of light that goes through, and then you have your microscope, and it's only looking at whatever is being lit up by that very thin sheet of light. This allows them to get a picture at every second of what's going on in every neuron inside that brain. Every second is still not that great, because neurons, you should be looking at them at about a millisecond uh, rate, a sample rate, if you want to get a good idea of what's happening. But, but this helps. This gets you quite far. It only works for very small brains, because you need to be able to see through them. You need to be able to shine that light all the way through and keep them intact and working while you're doing it. So this won't work for us. What we now use in animals, such as uh, rats, monkeys, and us, is generally electrodes. And electrodes have come a, far, come a long way. Um, we now have electrodes that contain a whole bunch of recording sites on a single probe. And here, if you can see that at all, it's, the probe sites are not much larger than individual neurons. In fact, it's getting to the point where some labs, like again the Boyden lab, are creating these ultra-dense electrodes where you have more recording sites than neurons, so the density is higher than the neurons. It helps with decoding because you don't have to figure out in a complicated mathematical way which neuron you're recording from by looking at the shape of the signal. So if you're recording from millions of neurons, you can handle that more easily. And also, they're attaching these optical channels on it so you can stimulate specific areas, specific types of neurons, and record from those neurons. That helps again. And it gets to be a very large array of neurons that you're putting in. So they're actually working on arrays now that will have more than a million electrodes. For some animals, this is great because a mouse only has a few million neurons, like 20 million. So if you can get a million recordings from that, you're getting close to seeing every neuron in a mouse brain active at the same time. Next slide, please. But it's going further than that. So there are some new uh, attempts to make even better recording devices. Well, the obvious thing was if we can optically stimulate, can we record optically? Is there a way to do that? And there's a thought that if you can build very thin fibers, nanofibers, that you could, for example, put in the vasculature and just leave there, and those nanofibers happen to be optoelectrically active, so for instance, you shine a light in, the light doesn't even need to leave the fibers, so it won't heat up the brain. You could put as many of these fibers in here as you want to that light is going to be affected by the electrical field that's near it. So if a neuron is active, it's going to change the refractive index of the material, it's going to modulate the signal, and if you have a very good signal where every bit of the signal is unique, you can look at the flight time until you receive that signal to find out where the location was of the neuron you're looking at. So you get location and you get activity. This is something that's not done yet, but it's a great idea. Another one, which is a bit more in the production phase, in the sense that we have a prototype, at least, that's been tested in mice, is this so-called wireless free-floating recording and stimulation. It's uh, also called NeuroDust. It's something that a bunch of researchers, I say a bunch because it's four different labs working together, at UC Berkeley came up with. And basically what it is is, well, what if we could just get rid of most of the electrode and we just had the bit that was recording? and you could keep that inside the tissue. How could we do that? Well, one way is by powering that electrode with ultrasound. Ultrasound transmits through brain tissue fairly well without heating it up too much. And then you could use the ultrasound also as a communication carrier so that you could find out what, how is the, how's the ultrasound signal being changed by the electric, electrical field near it. So it's similar to this one here, again, this changing of the signal based on the electric activity around, but in this case we have, we're talking about freely floating wireless electrodes. And that one, as I said, is in testing in mice. Okay, next please. Now, if we're doing all this recording, where are we on using the data? This here is just a little slide from, it's a figure from, uh, from the most recent publication that was in Cell uh, by the Human Brain Project. Um, it's very pretty. You can see that they showed that, yeah, okay, activity spreads 
and you can see oscillatory phenomena and stuff like that, which is kind of what you'd expect, but it's also not something extremely difficult to make when you're building a simulation. So we still have to find out if they're going to discover more intricate things from their model. And again, this was done, this was done with uh, just statistics, stochastic models of how the system is built, not from a specific piece of tissue. So this translation from a specific piece of tissue, specific activity, some of the best that we have is really the kind of constraints that were done for that hippocampal prosthesis. So through the system identification method, black box system identification. This method, which is trying to constrain a neuron model, this is a, you know, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations in a model with lots of compartments. That is what they're trying to do with the human brain project. That's very difficult, and we haven't really seen that much come out of it yet. Next slide, please. And where are we on implementing this? What would you run this on? Well, the, the Human Brain Project shows us one of the examples of what you might run it on. They're using giant supercomputers. Here's an example of a giant supercomputer. It's the Tianye 2 in China uh, that has a, what, a maximum speed of 33.8 petaflops, a petaflop being a million billion flops. And it consumes at that, at that speed 24 megawatts of power. Now, if you were going to try to simulate an entire human brain at, uh, done the way it's done at the Human Brain Project with these compartments, 10,000 compartments per neuron, hodgkin huxley equations on a supercomputer like this, you would need at least one exaflop. That's a billion, billion flops to do that. What is the power consumption at that point? Are we talking about a power plant for every brain emulation? That gets a little ridiculous. So, and the reason here is because it's not built to work the same way as the system that's in the brain. I mean, what's happening here is that you're wasting most of your energy shuttling around data between processors and memory. That happens all the time on CPUs, even CPUs with multiple cores. It even happens in GPUs that have a CPU that they need to work with. It doesn't happen in a neuromorphic architecture. That's an architecture where, again, just like in the brain, the memory that the processor requires is right there. It's local to that processor. It's in the synapses that sit there with it. This is an example of a chip that does that. In fact, this is the only commercially available one right now called the CM1K, and I, I work with this company, so a little disclosure there. Okay, right now that has 1,024 neurons on it, but they're about to start work on making a, a million neuron chip. And if you just look at this power performance curve here, this is giga operations per second per watt and you compare with the number of these processors here, you've got, uh, uh, you've got GPUs here, for example, they don't do very well compared to this one here. This is performing way better per watt. You, you can run this thing on 0.5 uh, milliwatts, the entire chip. So just to give you an impression of the comparison here. And I'm sure it's going to get better as time goes along. Now, if you're going to do whole brain emulation, if you're going to build these neural prostheses using specialized hardware. That's not going to be a neuromorphic chip such as the one that I pointed out here, no matter how much I like that company. Because these are very abstract neurons that are meant to do a very specific task, for example, to replace that bottom layer in the neural networks that are currently being used for deep learning. It's not meant to run a biological model of what the brain looks like in the most optimal way. But what's really going to happen is we're going to learn from working with systems like this, where you have many different processors and local memory, instead of the typical von Neumann type of computing that we're used to, we have to learn a lot about these. That's why I think working with them is very useful. Because what we really need to do is we need to carry out that system identification that Berger, for instance, did for his hippocampal prosthesis. From that, you get a mathematical model, and hopefully successful behavior. If you don't, you have to go back, keep iterating this. Once you're getting successful behavior from your, from your system, what you can do then is you can identify the parts that really do have to happen a lot in parallel. And that is what you put into the hardware. That's your optimized device. And it's going to be neuromorphic-ish, because we're neuromorphic-ish. I mean, our, we have neurons, right, and synapses, and that's what this is modeled after in a sense. But not exactly like these. So that's kind of the design method now. Next slide, please. So what's possible and by when? This here is a, a nice display of the uh, Drosophila brain again, just to show you how people are working on that at Janelia Farms. 
It's a great little organism because um, you're allowed to experiment with them in a lot of ways. People aren't as squeamish about doing this with insects as they are with many other animals. That knowing that we're already testing this hippocampal prosthesis in humans, and the results are really good, that it is probably going to be usable as an actual cure, repair for broken hippocampal regions within some similar amount of time. Of course, there's that whole FDA approval process and everything else that comes along with it when you're doing clinical trials. So, you know, there could be a slowdown. And then there's going to be work with brain machine interfaces, using neural interfaces for other purposes, such as, you know, fixing spines and, and, and other similar things. And then enhancements occasionally, right? I mean, if you can build a prosthetic retina, then why not also allow that retina to see UV light or something like that? So you're going to be able to add some enhancements in. Plus, if you have the hippocampal prosthetic, you can already do some cool things, which is why maybe even healthy people will want it once it's available. Because, for instance, you can record exactly when what activity happened in the hippocampus. You can record that this pattern happened on Tuesday at 12 o'clock. If you stimulate that specific pattern again, you're going to recall what you were thinking about, what the memory was that was being stored at 12 o'clock on Tuesday. I can't do that right now. I have to think, okay, I was at that party, I was talking to this person, then the clock struck 12, so oh, I must have been doing that. This whole cued recall thing. This is a whole different way of accessing memory, and it becomes possible by having direct access to what's happening inside the hippocampus. That's what it allows, and many other things. So this is going to be very interesting. And we think now, okay, but who's going to want to have surgery just to get you know, that special special feature. And yes, maybe that's frightening. Maybe we need better interfaces first, but maybe not. Because think about plastic surgery. It's not medically necessary in many cases. It comes with huge risks. People do it anyway, and it's FDA approved. Interesting. Okay. Now, my expectation for whole brain emulation, well, once you can do this all with a Drosophila brain, it's a matter of scale. Because the brain in the Drosophila has different compartments responsible for different things, many of which are very similar to the ones that we have. The neurons are really not that different, the synapses are not that different, the devices, the technology you need to record from them are not really different, but we have way more. So it's a scaling problem. And the question then becomes, how long does it take to do this and to also do the modeling, understand what's going on there? And that is not really a science and engineering problem as much as it is an economic and political problem. So for me, predicting that becomes really hard because I don't know how slow or how fast does something like that go. Sometimes people decide on an Apollo project. We have to get to the moon in so many years and they put in a lot of effort. And sometimes there are other priorities. So this is very hard to say without knowing those two factors. And I think the next one's my last slide. Yeah, so what does this mean for the far future? If you can do all this, if we can get adaptability through this sort of modification that we can do on ourselves, what does it really mean for human society? First of all, it's going to mean a lot more diversity in form and function because we can explore all these challenges that we would like to address that we currently can't address and not everyone's going to want to do the same thing. It also means that we can start, just like in our machines, to think more about thinking in the cloud, not something that's necessarily as closely associated to your actuators, your body, the things that you have out there in the world doing something. We're going to be vastly more connected, once again, and previous speaker, speakers have said this as well, and I hope that that means that it can lead to greater understanding and more empathy, sort of like being able to see what happens to people in war zones across the world now may be helping us have more empathy with what goes on there than it did in the past. Hopefully that's true. I mean, Steve Pinker seems to think so in his book. I think it's definitely going to mean a reduced separation between us and our inventions. It's going to become more and more something that develops in parallel and in sync. And again, that's something that previous speakers have also spoken of. And it's going to remove a lot of the barriers for exploration and creation that exist today so that we can experience and do what we really want to. So uh, that's why I think this is valuable. Thank you. So we, someone had mentioned earlier uh, Nick Bostrom from um, Oxford. Um, and he kind of has this simulation hypothesis where he lists out three possible things, rules out the first two as being unlikely, and then the third 
thing that results is, you know, we're in this big kind of simulation, kind of like The Sims. So if I think of something like whole brain emulation, okay, we've got the mathematical model that describes how the brain works based on our sensory input and the way we actuate based on that input. We have certain limitations which have been selected, right, through evolution. And I'm wondering if we do get this mathematical model for how things work, and we go and we start uploading ourselves into a virtual kind of existence, how then do the limitations that we currently have come into play? Do we still have the same desires once we're in this virtual emulated realm? Do we, can we even begin to imagine how our need to interact with the environment might change once we are in this, you know, we can, we can get rid of all the things that we have to uh, we have to do today. That's a really good question. Um, so first of all, before I get into that question, I just want to mention that I'm not, I'm not one of the people who feels that we necessarily will do something like sim only to get people into virtual reality because there's no reason why that has to be the case. You could get, you could have body. Why not? You can interact with the real world too, if this is the real world. I mean, Bostrom and all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're right. I mean, everything that our mind is used to at the moment and how we interpret things is based on our body, our embodiment and the kind of signals that we're getting from outside and what we expect and how we go about surviving. Um, and as that changes, I guess some things will change. Sometimes they're just slight changes. Like, uh, you know, our, our world today is not exactly the same as the world of hunter-gatherers. We have to deal with vastly more people in our lives than we used to have to. And somehow we had to adapt to that that vast amount of people that we run into every day. And so I guess we probably process that a little differently than people back then would have. Or I wonder what it's like for them if they suddenly appear in a society like this. You could try that with Aboriginal somewhere, if you're allowed to do those experiments. Um, but I can't really say how it will change people, because there are, beyond just those kinds of small changes, you could have much larger changes in terms of the possibilities that you can explore. And sometimes you could decide to, to voluntarily change your brain as well, to adapt the function that are in there. The, the possibilities, the realm of possibilities become so huge that as you keep looking further to more change, bigger change, bigger exploration, different environments, it becomes more and more unpredictable for me what that actually means. And you know, that's, once again, I guess that's the concept of the singularity, right? I can't, I can't really look beyond that and understand it at this moment. You can only walk to the next like the you know this horizon built by this fog of yeah, not knowing, work. and then try to look again from there, and and that's kind of my approach. Say I understand this much, and it makes sense when I put down the rationale like this for why this is a good thing to do, because things won't always stay the same, and if we care about ourselves and our species at all, then maybe we do want to be able to adapt. It seems like a good thing to do, but I can't really see far beyond that. That's my answer. Sorry, if it's not more interesting. Yeah, you. Uh, uh, you showed that the platform design race of uh, from system identification to mathematical model to successful behavior. Yeah, with this five part uh, diagram. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we are living, every one of us living in our inner, inner world, in a existential reality, you can call it psychological reality. Yeah. So, this is a view from a third party, uh, like you are a researcher, you are doing some device, the, the optimized device is, is an end point. Mm -hmm. So there's no place for, for myself, for, for the consciousness. I wish you could just flip back between these yeah. slides, now it's not so handy that's there, but we don't have to go back there, but this is really what the yeah. slide that I had, that had all the little circles on it, where I was trying to go take you through the process of mind uploading and see, that one? does this mean something changes? No, no, no. This one here, yes, this one. Yes, I wanted to go back to that one, because you're talking about the difference between the outside objective view, first person, the first person subjective view. Now, of course, this system that we're trying to design there is meant to be the one that replaces your subjective self in the sense that it is all of the processes, all of the memory, everything that's inside you. Now, how is that going to be replaced? It could be replaced in this way. But if you follow this through all the way to the end here, and you see these two separate systems that have evolved out of that, 
what if you were to just build this system separately and never have it connected with the one before, but it is just, it's identical, it's materially and in every way identical to this. This is a thought experiment. Wouldn't that also be you? This is a really big question because it seems like when people think that it wouldn't be you somehow, even though it was produced, it, it, it has the exact material end result, the same one as the one that was done in this sort of constantly connected way. It seems almost like the, the, the personal theory people have about personal identity and how it exists somewhere or goes somewhere is like a virus. It's like it has to, you have to be in touch with it, you have to be in contact with it, and only then can it transfer itself over to that, and then maybe you can cut it loose. But if you're saying it's a virus, all you're saying really is that, I mean, if you believe in, in, if you're not a dualist, but you believe in a material source of yourself, then you would have to say, well, if we do consider it a virus, something's attached to this and it has to somehow save itself by moving over to the next part or spreading to, to be across all of them, the original and the prosthetic, and then get cut loose then it really means that there's something deeper down that you haven't looked at. So you haven't done enough iterations to discover the resolution at which you're supposed to be looking and what you're supposed to be taking with you. Because if you could also, like I said, we can generalize beyond neurons and synapses. If you also, in these two here, created all of that virus in here, identically to the one that was here, would it still not be you? Does it still have to touch? So I'm not going to say that I have the final answer of the, on this, but I am currently writing a paper, actually two papers with uh, co-authors, that are addressing specifically the questions about personal identity, survival, and how does that, how is that affected not just by mind uploading in general, but by different procedures or ideas that one can have about mind uploading, how it's done, if it's done in that fashion where you know one neuron is replaced at a time, or where we replace all neurons at the same time, but we had them all connected first, you know, and we just cut made cuts. Or if it's done by building something completely separate, the sort of scan and build approach. And what does it mean if you've got, if the original survives rather than if the original has to be destroyed in the process, which by the way, right now, every method conceivable for making them so far destroys the original, so it's not a very real, uh, that's not a real practical consideration at the moment. But I'm, I'm, I'm writing two papers about it, and it's a bit too long to get into it all right now, but I just wanted to at least make you question your assumptions about what self is, beyond it being a model that's being run inside of you that is giving you an impression of a consistent self or a stream of consciousness. I'm reminded of Laplace's demon, that thought experiment, where if you have all the information about the entire state of the universe, the, the position and momentum of all the particles, right, you could potentially predict anything going forward. So I'm thinking, if you consider the brain as a sort of computer, it's got information, it's got state, and it's got these registers, and you know, you know what the program counter is and what's going to happen next. So is there, is there, are we kind of jumping the gun to say that there is a bottom level where you're capturing a whole state? And also to say that you could instantaneously capture the state so you could faithfully, identically reproduce a person? I'm, I'm loving this because these are all the exact same questions that we're writing papers about right now to answer the, what I call the most frequently asked questions, basically, because it comes up all over, all the time. Now, first of all, of course, if you look at just the example of Berger's hippocampal thing and the fact that his patients don't complain about it, so at least in some sense, practically speaking, probably we're going to learn to live with it and not care. Sort of like we don't care very much about whether pacemakers are going to be a problem or getting a replacement heart is a problem, things like that. So that's just from a practical point of view. But, but just thinking philosophically about it is, it, is it possible to take a piece of reality and identify what's going on there and replace it with something that works just like it. Identically? Probably not. But can biology even replicate its own activity? No, because all neurons and synapses are extremely unreliable. If you were to put, and, there's, and there are simply totally unpredictable things in nature anyway, if you were to take the brain, run it for a second, and you could take the same brain, run it again, that same second, from the same state, it would not produce the same exact outcome. Even biology can't replicate its own results exactly, but it can enough so that you can consistently kind of be yourself from day to day, so that you can communicate with other people, and so that brain regions inside your head can communicate with each other. In fact, the brain goes through quite some lengths to try to be more digital and predictable. 
instead of using individual spikes that are not reliably carried out through neurons or synapses, it uses bursts very often. It uses many neurons at the same time, so that if some of them are not firing, that whole pattern will still get through. So there are redundancies. It uses oscillations in the brain to make sure that there is a inhibition and an enhancement of activity at certain phases so that different regions can be phase locked and they can recall at one phase and send it information to the other and receive it then. So it's making it very digital and not as analog as it seems. So the question really kind of becomes more like the audiophiles question. Can I really reproduce this record by putting it on a CD? Well, it depends what your goal is. What is your success criteria? For most people, give it enough bits, probably you can. And the same way, if your success criterion here is that all your internal processes are working the same way, it feels the same way, you think the same way, well, the same, you know, as I said, biology can't even replicate itself, but in the same fashion, as the same person. You aren't aware of which synapse in your brain is doing what. I have no idea which synapse is firing. I don't know where any neurotransmitters inside me are right now. I'm completely unaware of those things. So that is not the stuff that's happening at the level of my awareness. What's happening at the level of my awareness are things like being able to perceive that there's a person standing over there and having a conversation with you. If all of those things work and I still feel the same way when I see a red rose, then that could be my success criterion for successful whole brain emulation. And if that's not good enough for you, then you should probably not do it. <laughs> Last question, we're running out of time. Okay, I'll pick someone. Sorry, I'm going to pick, you can ask me later, but I'm going to pick someone else because of... Uh, yeah, this actually, yeah. You, you started to address it just now. So there's a lot of noise and unpredictability at the biological level. So in terms of information encoding algorithmic level, can you give a sense of what the ratio is? So could you perhaps emulate a hundred the functionality of a hundred neurons using one silicon neuron because it's much more reliable and you don't need to have all this noise correction? I mean, did, do, do people have a sense of what that ratio Probably would be? Probably the other way around. <laughs> well. Okay, right now, yes, if we're trying to be as precise as possible in how to simulate uh, a biological neuron, then right now, in terms of these artificial neurons I showed, it takes more artificial neurons to simulate one biological neuron. That said, though, once you understand what's going on in the brain and you know what you're trying to capture, it's probably likely that you can do that in a more efficient way by using things that are more reliable. And that's kind of what AGI tries to do, right? In AGI, you're making systems differently in a way that doesn't have to rely on how biology is limited in some ways. Um, I think that requires more understanding about what's going on in the brain, though. At the moment, when you look at what Ted Berger is trying to do, I mean, this is an example. Ted Berger is doing things differently. He is using a completely different system, no neurons in there, to replicate what's going on in the hippocampus. He made a mathematical model, but he still has to say, okay, what's the input at these neurons and what's the output at those neurons and reproduce that because he has to talk with that biological system that it needs to go to. So he's restricted by that. He can't just compress this to a more efficient mathematical model. But at some point, if you're going to get rid of all those pieces, then maybe you can simplify the math. Very last question. Very one, last. one more question? Okay, I, the, he's had his hand up for a long time. I'm yeah, I'm talking about Ted Berger's experiments in my class, and I'm wondering, my students always ask the same question. His, his model, well, actually his experiments show transplantability of uh, memories from one rat to another rat, which implies the possibility of implanting false memories or somebody else's memories inside of a person's hippocampus. Yeah. And the ethics of that, it bothers a lot of my students. Yeah, you won't have to worry about that yet. Because the, um, the reason why, during my talk, I said, the hippocampus is kind of a special case, and I won't get into it, is because the hippocampus is kind of a special case. The hippocampus is not the place where your memory is stored long term. The hippocampus is the place that acts like a pointer. Uh, during your experiences, various parts of your brain light up. There's a pattern that lights up in your visual perception, a pattern in your auditory perception, a pattern here, a pattern there. Many different regions doing different things. How do you remember that when we were having this talk here, that there were these lights, there was some humming sound in the background, maybe we weren't even aware of that, and we were saying certain things. All of these patterns have to be associated, and we have to associate them not just in parallel, but also in time. And that's what the hippocampus does. The hippocampus basically recruits some cells, 
and creates a connection, a pointer. It's like pointers in computers almost. A pointer to those regions where those patterns are active. So that if you want to recall what happened, you activate those pointers and they reactivate those patterns in the rest of the brain. That's not where the information stays. This recruitment here is something that's only temporary. It's for maybe a few days. And then as you rec repeat this in sleep, for example, in slow wave sleep cycles, you go through the same activity in the hippocampus that you saw during waking experience. It reactivates those patterns in the same order. If you do that often enough, then the patterns themselves have a chance to create connections between one another, to strengthen the synapses. So ultimately, the memory is offloaded, is put away into the neocortex, where you have these auditory, visual, etc. memories. And those are the specific memories. And the hippocampal cells are recycled. They get used again for something else. So they're like some cache, a buffer set of cells. That's why it's really easy to replace that area of the brain. That's why when he took that same model and worked in neocortex, he didn't try to replace a set of neurons in the neocortex like he did in the hippocampus. Instead, he only looked at broken connections between two layers where he could apply the same principle. But the theory that you can use this system identification still holds. It's just that if you want to build a system through system identification that replicates what was going on in a piece of brain, you need to record from that piece of brain while it's intact so that you get the intact activity from input to output. In the hippocampus, because these cells are so replaceable, you can have a patient who had a stroke there. The hippocampus is broken. You have the generic model that they built using other patients as an example and put it in, which is just like taking your hippocampal model from one rat to another. And by the way, it didn't give the rat the other memory. It just made it easier to learn. So there was already some sequence of those pointers set up, and then the pointers just had to connect with the right patterns elsewhere. So that's why hippocampus is the same example. Now, can you ever just download Kung Fu, as in the Matrix? <laughs> in the long term, probably yes, but it's going to require translation. Because you're going to have to be able to go, okay, so, he's got his Kung Fu stored in this part of his brain that connects to how he moves his muscles. These neurons over here are the ones that talk to his legs and his arms, and they're set up in that way. Now, in this patient here, his arms and legs are controlled by those neurons in a different pattern, so we have to translate that, and we have to take this Kung Fu stuff and make those connections all work out with his arms and legs, and, you know, because the, the patterns are not stored in the same way in everyone's brain, so you need to do a lot of translating. You basically have to read the entire brain on this side, read the entire brain, understand it, then you can start taking knowledge and putting that in. It's not as easy as the Matrix makes it look. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to have a lunch break until this 3.15, we're going to skip the uh, discussion because we're running out of time. So this 3.15 hour, next presenter is uh, Julia Prisco.